Welcome to the Buildology Podcast. I'm Perry. I'm Randy. I'm Matt. I'm Justin. And we're going to help you become a Buildologist. I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live! Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Thing sucks. <laughs> that never gets old. That never gets old. Oh, you gotta love <laughs> Oh, Riley. You imagine, see how much hair he had back then? I know, That's it's crazy. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, welcome to episode number six here. I'm going to make a quick camera uh, correction here that I saw. So um, you guys get us started and kick us off. So we're, we're live, but... I'm cut off and uh, Perry over there is in, in full camera here. <laughs> so uh, we were all watching the intro as that, w- that was going. So uh, uh, Perry, why don't you get us started here with uh, this week's uh, topic. Talking about the hidden cost, the things that people don't recognize or they don't acknowledge, I guess I should say, whether you're a realtor, a developer, a builder, uh, or, or just a, a uh, consumer, that you don't think about the hidden cost when you're buying a home. The easiest example is something, excuse me, as simple as landscaping. You go into a community, and that community has requirements for landscaping. It may be a budget. It may be a plant count. It may be something as simple as landscape. I mean, as irrigation. They may say, you have to have an irrigation system, and it'll tell you mm-hmm. the number of stations. But if that's not disclosed to you, then that's something that'll surprise you. It could be simple as fencing. Yeah. Is it split rail fencing? Is it cedar fencing? Is it wrought iron fencing? There's a significant difference. And Randy, you know the difference in those costs. How big of a swing is there between just a standard six foot cedar fence and yet a decorative wrought iron fence that may be on a golf course or on a on a lake? Well, you're talking as far as linear foot cost goes, I mean they can range there could be a big swing of four to six to ten dollars a linear foot, depending on what material that you're putting in. Yeah. So if you so, think about ten dollars a foot and you're running a hundred linear foot of fence, that's a thousand dollars that you didn't know about when you bought you thought I'm buying on the lake and I'm paying them that lot premium and I'm excited about having that view. And then you find out that twenty thousand dollar expense becomes a thirty thousand dollar expense because of the additional fencing, additional landscaping. That's true. Well, and and not only that, but I mean if you did your budget, you created your budget two, three months ago, and you're looking at doing a six-foot cedar fence today, the cost, again, with the rising prices that we're seeing, absolutely. especially in lumber right now, yeah, absolutely incredible. And the only way you Big get time. around that or you can av- avoid that is having a contingency fee exactly. built in. Yeah. And that way you've got some room. You've got some room to be able to negotiate. But then you think about things that you don't even see. How many communities do you go into where the community, the CCRs or the HOA, they require that you put rebar of a certain size in the sidewalk? You don't see that. You don't benefit from that. All you know is that there is a sidewalk. The alternative is wire mesh, much less expensive. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you uh, from personal experience on uh, on one of my biggest ones that I've seen is like HOA fees when you get in there. Um, I can remember it few years back building in a neighborhood it had a client buy a lot in this neighborhood wanted to build a house and uh, I go down there to get all the information just closed on the lot and they had a twelve thousand um, dollar repavement fee yeah. in the HOA that they collected and so their lot increased by twelve uh, thousand dollars to recoup surprise. that it was like a surprise surprise here you go before you even you know, start the build, there There went your upgrades of yeah. whatever you wanted to do into a repavement fund. And, and a good example of that would be if you live on the water and there's a bulkhead. Right. The bulkhead has to be repaired. Right? Yeah. They take the cost of that bulkhead and they divide it up over all the lot owners that have access to that water. And then, and you may have never, you may not own a boat, you may have never been in that lake, but you may get a two, three, or $4,000 yeah. Adjustment that you have to pay for. Yeah, yeah. and some we've all seen, I and mean, we've all been doing this a long time. But anytime you create a budget, I mean, that's what you're projecting your cost to be, and also your time frame. Yeah, that you're looking at. My experience has been, and it's no different for you guys, is that you're all. It almost always turns out that you're going to come in a bit over budget. You're going to come in over the amount of time that you budgeted. So you have to plan for that. It's the nature of the beast. That's what it is. Yeah. I've seen, you're talking about HOAs. I've been involved or and seen to where it's written in the HOA documents that every time that home is sold in that neighborhood, 
one percent of that sales price goes to the HOA. Have you seen yeah, that before? Yeah, I've yeah. seen that before. So yeah. it could be resold ten times, but every time that HOA is going to get one percent of the sales price of that yeah. home. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm negotiating with some some buyers in an existing community nearby where we are now, and there's a transfer fee. Mm-hmm. Every time the title mm-hmm. change or the deed yep. changes yeah. names, you have to pay two thousand dollars is what it boils down right. to. It has to right. be paid to the HOA. Yeah. Yeah. Or in this case, it's POA. Same thing. Yeah. Property yeah. association. Yep. Yeah, I've seen some. You know, that you talk about hidden costs. <clears throat> a buyer coming in. Um, that, that's really kind of that notification um, that y- you want to let people know they're in an HOA. Yeah, but how many people actually pull the documents, scan through it, and add up all these fees that are in Like, that? that is so rare for even, someone to do. Even right. the builders. <clears throat> the builders I've recognized don't do that. They don't yeah. look at what's required. And you have to submit your plans by a certain timeline. If you miss that timeline or if oh, they don't approve month. it, yeah. there's yeah. another month. But there's also another fee. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. every time they kick it back to you, what you thought was $1,000, it's $450 every time you resubmit it. Yeah. And so your builder, if he's not on top of his game, is going to miss that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of hidden fees in, in a HOA, and um, you know every area is different, but the tighter the neighborhood, the more expensive those fees and the requirements and what they require. Um, and it's something, another thing I want to bring up real quick, and Mac, you will be the best person to answer this question. What does it cost for a, a septic system, and what does it cost to be able to install one of different types and so forth on your acreage communities you sell in today? Well, again, this this entire week has been insane on the on the new home <laughs> building uh, scene. Uh, I can tell you what a septic system cost yesterday. Okay, and what did it cost uh, yesterday? Average for an aerobic <laughs> system is about eight thousand dollars. Today it could be ten thousand. I have no clue. So put it in perspective: yeah. the yeah. average person on the street, the average realtor that's not knowledgeable of what's happening in multiple style of communities, whether it be a subdivision, whether it be an acreage community. They say, well, I'm buying in this community, and this lot's going to cost me $50,000, and it's only right. it's less than a quarter of an acre. But I can go out to this community out here in the country, and I can spend $40,000, and I can get a full acre. Yeah. And then yeah. you have to add on to that yeah. the, the septic system. You, you have to take down the trees. You took down some trees today at your home. I did. How much did that cost you? I personally didn't. Uh, three tall pine trees we had them the stumps ground and we actually had some roots that were kind of peeking up through right, i mean grinding stumps grinding <laughs> stumps you know yeah <laughs> but it was i mean it was just south of twenty five hundred dollars twenty five hundred dollars so. yeah. okay so now that forty thousand dollar lot that you say it's an acre lot i'm getting a better deal but you spent eight thousand dollars on the septic now if it's twenty five hundred dollars for how many trees did you take down just three trees and you're in the business so you probably got a good deal so the average person if you're taking down, imagine you're taking down 30 trees. Yeah. No, it's a lot. Well, and, and you bring up a great point, Perry, because uh, the site development side of it, you know, you've got basically three components that go into the total price. You've got the uh, the land cost, and it is whatever it is. And then you've got the actual construction cost, and then you have site development. The first two, you can pretty well define those. It's the third part where the variables come in, just like you said. And then take it one step further. Let's say for the developers that might be listening to us and the people that think they want to develop a few lots, they say, I saw a five-acre track, I can put some lots on it, and I can sell those lots. Okay, obviously we talked about Seward. Where, where are you going to flush the toilet to? And they say, oh, I'm going to buy outside the city so I save money. No, now you have to put in the sewer system. But think about the streets, the paving. Is it concrete? Is it asphalt? Is it a rollover curb or is it a standard curb? So from the builder's perspective, are they having to pay for a curb cut? And from the developer's perspective, what's the underlayment required? What's the underpaper? Right. Yeah, what, you, if it's an open ditch area, I mean, who's going to put the bingo. culvert in? I mean, you know, what, what size? So they can all make a big difference. So yeah. what, we should, what we should consider in a future episode or a master class is giving a checklist, giving people the knowledge of no, so they can be educated when they go right. into a buying scenario and they know what to ask for because you'll discover what the hidden costs really right, are. Right. So let's ask the, uh, we've got quite a few people on uh, YouTube and Facebook right now. So that, let's uh, put it out there and just see if they, they have any questions in regards to um, outside the normal type of fees that someone might run into in an industry that, um, you know, cause I can think of like a million different um, things that come in. I was even thinking um you know, I used to do some like in town stuff where we'd 
go buy a old house, tear it down and, you know, redo it and stuff like that. And you think for a minute and you're like, wow, great. I'm not in an HOA and you've avoided all that stuff. <laughs> we got one time we were in a historical district and had to meet the historical requirements, um, tore an old house down and <laughs> you get yeah, in there and you get, now you're in big trouble, you know, <laughs> you and just like, build a new old house. There. Yeah, we that's built a new right. old house. Well, that's kind of what the market wanted. And you know, that, that, it was it was a nice thing, but there's a lot of extra cost, and um, so so that was kind of not an HOA, but like a local government um, type deal. I can tell you an, uh, a personal experience downtown Houston buying a lot that ended at, at the end of a cul-de-sac or at the end of a dead end. The sewer didn't reach the dead end; it stopped oh, at the intersection. Yeah. So the city said, you're benefiting by extending this street further down. So right. you have to put in the manhole to our specification. Yeah. And it's only going to cost you $40,000. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, who budgets for that? Yeah. Yeah. How do you even know? And yeah. then, of course, they charge you the permit for that, which was another $12,000. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, exactly. the, the, the way to avoid yeah. that is to do your research, do all your yeah. planning up Bingo. front. If you yeah. know you the really questions to, to ask, yeah. if you're, if you're yeah. an educated buyer yeah. and you know what to ask up front and do your due diligence, that's what yeah. we call it. And another diligence. great point, too, is a recent project that I was involved in is that you know, at first blush, it looked like this project was in the county, very limited inspections involved. But once you start digging in a little bit, making a few phone calls, you find out it's in an ETJ, yeah. extraterritorial yeah. jurisdiction. Yeah. You might as well be in the city. You might as well be in the city. Yeah. So a yeah. few more phone calls and you find out, hey, I've got all these inspections I got to deal with. And again, all the, the fees that go along with that. So, yeah. Better do your homework. And these builders that ha are used to building in a subdivision and they know what their costs are and they have right. one superintendent managing 10 homes, yeah. all of a sudden they're building in 10 different ETJs, right. 10 yeah. different counties, yeah. 10 different locations. They have 10 different rule books. Yeah, they and that's something we can definitely help a lot of investors and a lot of folks that are out there that may not be familiar with that. We've yeah, been we there. Can, We've all been yeah. there and done Yeah, because yeah. when you get into like flipping houses and stuff like that, you're... you're you don't have a preset. You're, you're going to pick up a deal this part of town, that part of town. And, you, you know, it's not just the property that you're, you're flipping. It's, you know, getting all the things that go with that property. You know, like well, I, I said, tell you, on flipping a house, for example, when you tear into a wall, if you take down a certain percentage of the wiring, yeah, you have to now meet the current electrical code. Yeah. That's and when you do that. <clears throat> Now you're pulling out wires that you didn't intend to pull out. Before. Right, right. Same right. thing with plumbing. Same thing, of course, with air conditioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and you know, if you're you're trying to rehab a house in the '60s with plumbing back then, with plumbing today, with cast you, iron, you're going to want to rip it all out. That's right. Switching from one to the other is not a pleasant thing. So, but if you think about it, how many homes have you been into where you're starting on one side of the house, but because you met that percentage of changeover? Now the electrician, I mean electrical inspector comes yeah. in and says, your box doesn't fit code anymore. There On goes the your side. entire profit, 100%. everything down well, We've tubes. got a pretty good question here regarding solar. Is the initial investment worth the home energy savings over time? Are many home builders even interested in solar, or is it still not a mainstream option? If not, do you think it will ever become a standard in homes? I think that's a fantastic question. Great question. And um, the, the answer is, is it uh, mainstream? It's not mainstream yet, but it's one of those things that's on an S curve. And so it's happening in the market and the transition is in place. We're just not in the point of the curve that where you look around, and you see it on every home. Now, if you went more West Coast, you're definitely going to interact with it a lot more. Um, but in South Texas here, we get plenty of sun. So there's nothing stopping us. Um, I would say the electric companies that are, you know, providing us electricity are a little slower to the to the game than what happened in the West Coast where they have, you know, you can push power back. And that's really the thing. Um, if you're not trying to push power back, that means you have to have a battery and then your cost goes up over time. Um, well, not your cost goes up initially because you're buying all the batteries if they it's called net metering when they allow you to push it backwards. Um, and so they're it's really just power company to power company. Are they going to allow you to have push that meter back? And that's kind of a local, um, you have to get that answer first. And if they don't allow you to push it back, what you're doing is trying to get the solar and, uh, you know, charge up a battery and then use it off of there. And then that will get 
expensive because you're trying to store enough for the whole house to do it. But as far as we had this conversation, I think it was like episode three. It, we did. As a matter of fact, there was something on mm-hmm. the news about a gentleman in southwest Houston, Sugarland area, that had the Tesla battery mm-hmm. packs on his home. He said it cost him about thirty-five to thirty-six thousand dollars additional cost. Right. His utility bill was twenty dollars a month. Yeah. So let's be conservative. Say that he's saving three hundred dollars a month in right. his utility bill. Over a year, that's $3,600. Right. So that's 10 years right. is the payback. Yeah. So the answer that I would give to that question is, how long do you plan on owning the property? Yeah, and my thing is, uh, that's 10 years of the payback, but you also did something that increased the property value of your home that you won't get 100% return on, but when you come to sell that home and you have a $20 electric bill and the competing house doesn't have a con- you know has, still has a $300 bill, there's going to be some value you're going to get back for that. So I'd say the payback is even quicker than that. So it's probably in the six to seven year um, payback period of what you're going to get. You just won't realize that value until you sell that house. Um, And of course, hopefully he got testimonials from every person that lived with him for that entire week. Because he said every neighbor on the street was in his home. He was the only one that had power on the street. He's the only one. And so it served that he didn't go out and spend 10 to 15,000 on a backup generator either. Correct. Right. So he has, he has that. And, you know, I I would say when it comes to selling his house, that'd be the one feature. There's a, a, a market there that wants that. If you're the only one that has it, that house is going first. You made a comment recently about the backup generator versus the solar power because the backup generator is only there when you need it. Yeah. Solar power is there every day. Every day. Right. And so you're yeah. getting a daily return on your investment there right. instead of that time when you need it, when you have to have right. it. Well, right. Well, I think like if talking about going mainstream, I, I, like you said, I haven't really seen it go mainstream, but I also don't see a lot of education on it either. Yeah. Um, any builder that is of size and of volume is if they're offered, that's offered it as a luxury upgrade still, right. you know, kind of almost like a supplemental versus, uh, you know, it's, it's the extra you need when you need it type thing. But I think there's just not a lot of marketing toward that on a mass scale. Yeah, the- so I don't know if anybody even knows all the, you know, what questions to ask because it's just not presented very much. Right. Yeah, the problem with it is right now is it's um, one of those things that, a buyer has to go out into the retail market and grab a contractor because the pieces that you need to it. So they're going on top of a roof. So someone has to deal with a roof. Then you got it on electrical deal and then someone to buy the actual bits and pieces of it. Right. So it's kind of an interesting trade when we look at it from the building side of it uh, to us in the home building world, that'd be three different trades. And so I've actually talked to our electrician um, on a, future project that we're looking into some solar stuff. And I think there's going to be a really big market for a builder that brings it in on the wholesale side that works with an electrician that hands a product off to the roofer while he's up there installing the roof because they're super easy to install. They're, I mean, very, very easy. They're not like they used to be where you had to do all this complicating wiring. They literally just plug one into the next. It's, you know, uh, like a childproof connector, like a black and white wire click <laughs> and you just string them all together and then they string a wire down and then the electrician handles that. So there's no reason the roofer couldn't get on the roof, do the installation, leave the wire coming down. The electrician shows up, installs, does the connection and it'd be a pretty minimal fee. So, you know, my estimation is you could take that $30,000 cost and you can probably get it in the eight and $9,000 wholesale cost and you start doing that and cutting that bill by that much. That, that's pretty drastic. That's really, right. quick that's really packed. Yeah. Quick, quick, that quick. That could be two or three year payback at that point. Two or three. And, you know, I think there's a whole market of people that would want to buy that house over another one, especially in a new construction setting. This one has it and this one doesn't. And, you know, if you can get it in the $10,000 range, that, that's a pretty strong buying indicator and I think at that point. Tesla, obviously, Elon Musk, I mean, he's the guy yeah. driving this. Right. He's, he's it's just driving the prices does. down. Right. That's right. And then on top of it, so it's kind of labor intensive. And when you go out in the, into the market and the guy's got to deal with resales and stuff like that. Well, in new construction world, everything's happening in the order that it should. And if you just hand the right pieces to the right person, the cost is going to come down because no one, no one guy has to tackle it all. You've split the task up. And so that's why home building is as affordable as it is because it's a subcontract market. You take 
experienced trades and plug them in. You know, we don't have roofers running electrician stuff, right? So right. Uh, you just let the roofer do what the roofer do you, does and the electrician do what the do electrician does. you have a does. specific builder in mind that I, you think might be considering I, that? I think I have a builders? specific guy. I <laughs> yeah. think I, I, think I have sure a guy. <laughs> yeah. And a specific electrician and a yeah. specific roofer. <laughs> let me scratch my head on that one. <laughs> let me think you know, who that could be. <laughs> it's interesting, though, but since we had the major, uh, the, the freeze apocalypse. Snow apocalypse. Snow apocalypse. Snow apocalypse. It's official. At this point, in, in February, the, the snow apocalypse. You know, it's that that topic has really started to surface a lot more uh, than it has in the past. Because again, we had people that were out of without power for days, weeks in some cases, and uh, so yeah, people are asking about that. I've even started fielding questions about geothermal heating and cooling in this area, which is yeah, that's that's that, really that's an interesting one yeah. for sure. Cutting you know, edge, yeah. Yeah, that's one I, I, I've I looked at very little, but the, the amount that I looked at it, I mean, there's some promise there, but it's getting the trade base for it. Um, I, I kind of relate it back to when, like, spray foam insulation come came around, um, hardy plank, things like that. Anything new to the market has yeah. a tough time getting that foothold. But in this industry, once it gets a foothold, that's just what it is. Yeah, so it's I accepted. Think solar's that way, geothermal, yeah. these alternative solutions are going to be that way we're just on the front end of it well but why and then just you can go in in my opinion add rainwater collection rainwater systems to that yeah because yeah. i've seen very sophisticated mm-hmm. systems for that where they store them in underground tanks at certain you know a certain depth to keep it a certain temperature and it's yeah. a supplement of water supply so there, i mean it's all of the above on, on that now, now that. what you're talking about is being completely off the grid which yes. again yeah. more people are thinking about yeah yeah, and there's reasons come, for that. It's coming to Austin yeah. overnight. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Austin yeah. has made that move already. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of, you know, I think you get coronavirus, power outages, snowpocalypse, you, all these things where people realize that, wait a minute, I have to retreat to my home, and home is what it is. It's, it's home, but it's a little bit more important, I think, in 2021 in people's mind than it was in 2020. It's your it's your refuge. Right, and, that's uh, where you're going and... Yeah. and we have hurricanes here. We have floods. We have snow apocalypses. I mean, COVID. COVID. I mean, I mean if you're on, yeah. I think every state kind of has their own little little thing. You know, maybe I don't yeah. know. I guess North Dakota I don't know, freezes in North. I guess every state has. Maybe there's a state that doesn't have anything. But if you're in Kansas, you got tornadoes, and you yeah, know, spent, you're California, you got some fires in North Dakota, and they talked about yeah. snow exceeding their basketball goals. Oh man! I mean, they were trapped in their home, so they would go to the grocery mm. store and buy groceries for uh, several weeks. Three, four inches shut Texas down. I think I could dunk on a uh, <laughs> basketball goal that's got, you know, a, about a foot of snow at the top of it. Fortunately, you get lost in the snow. <laughs> right. now, you talk about geothermal. It's, it is quite popular up north yeah. where it gets really cold. Yeah. Uh, I've got a friend of mine that lives in Phoenix, and he was complaining uh, last time I talked to him not too long ago, uh, this summer, or not to maybe last summer, they had 110 days of over 100 degree temperature. Yeah. Wow! Now it, they always call it at the dry heat. <laughs> yeah. But his problem was he lived here for so long, he didn't realize that it, he was you, he'd lose all that water. Like you oh, don't know you're yeah. sweating. You don't sweat, but you're right. still losing yeah, water. Right. So he had to readjust his water intake. But yeah. it kind of goes along as those extremes. Uh, you know, I was thinking rainwater yeah. collection down here just. If, if you can keep it a bucket out of the floodway systems when yeah. we get those rainstorms in and collect it, that just helps with the overall right. deal. Here's an interesting it, fact that um, Elon tweeted out. Uh, it was probably a year ago now. Um, I think it had to do with when he was releasing like an update to a Tesla battery or something. And I think I probably have the fact wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double the size, but I think it was a one mile by one mile. But let's just say it's a... He, he basically showed a two mile by two mile. If you took a two mile by two mile area of Nevada and covered it in solar panels, that's all we would need to power the United States. And, and I mean, you, you think of that and you, you zoom out and you look at that from space. That's not a, that's not a very not big, a big area, deal. right? Yeah. So, so there, the, the, the ability is there. So if you start talking about putting uh, solar panels on people's roofs and you know, there's a lot of technologies out there where the glass is a solar panel and you can still see through it and you start yeah. doing buildings downtown with the surface yeah. area and stuff. I think it's something it's, that's it's coming. It's definitely coming. And as a builder, investor, you know, it's stuff that you got to have your radar open to. Um, there, there's just too many changes that if you're not paying attention, 
um, you might be putting a product out there that no one wants. And Justin, I think you've got Elon Musk's cell number, so we had to call him I, up. I sometime. have his Twitter just, page. I, I, I did send him. him up. I sent him a tweet the, a couple of weeks ago. I didn't hear back. I don't know why. He's busy. <laughs> I think he's, he's a busy. little busy. Running Even for his best friend, being he's the richest busy. guy in the world. I don't know. Yeah. He's, he yeah. might be. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's a little a, busy. Shoots off space rockets, so he's yeah, got, he's got some things going on. Yeah, but you know, it's interesting mm-hmm. talking about the geothermal um, alternative that's out there right now. Technically, that's a misnomer. Uh, in this area, it's more, like you said, up north, geothermal. Uh, in this area, it's more uh, dealing with ground source heat pumps. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. You know, and you you get into where you have vertical loops, horizontal loops, pond loops, uh, where you've got that closed system, closed loop system uh, that, that helps heat and cool your home. So those are some things that, again, we can work with people on. We can give you some ideas of some of the you know, alternate technologies that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I mean, there, there's a, there's a bunch of alternate technologies coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, and with the cost of things right now, the, where they are and people just trying to get a handle on where costs are. Once that start sorts out, um, as it will, uh, all markets eventually reach some level of equilibrium. True. Um, and so we're just kind of dealing with an up and who knows, uh, even if it keeps going up, at least people will have the ability to adjust for it, to it. Everyone's reacting to it right now, and it's right. tough to just react to it, like from nothing to something. But a positive, strong up, everyone can anticipate, you know. And then you start adjusting, and, and that that'll allow those alternative things to come into the market, is because you can start forecasting and yeah. planning. And it's interesting too. Once you have <clears throat> any of these dramatic changes, like pricing and uh, you know material uh, availability issues and things like that, it does open customers' minds to alternatives. And so I'm yeah. seeing more people that are more flexible saying, hey, can we try this? Can we do that? Which is, you know, in, in the long run, I think it's a good thing. And as they try the new alternatives and the pricing goes down. That, that's called yeah. progress. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing you mentioned earlier about having the, the labor force available, as those alternatives come in, people will retrain. Right? Yeah, they'll, exactly. Because they don't know how to install right. solar panels, right. but they'll learn. But it's when they find out, like, you know, it, it's going to be something very small and it hardy playing like you can throw any new technology out there. Once the trade base got it, what happens is the trade base says, wait a minute, I can make money doing this. And the trade base takes off and runs for it because they know they can charge a premium over what they right. were doing, but it's still drastically diff- less than what the retail market is. They can get that 20 percent more margin doing this new thing. And you'll see the ones, the movers and the shakers within like spray foam, for example, when it came out, you know, no one could afford to do a spray foam house unless you were north of even north of a million. It was like 1.2, 1.4 million. That's the only place that you saw spray foam. And we spray foam everything we do now. Yeah. It just doesn't even make sense to do the other stuff. Right. And it's because that trade base hopped on it and was like, man, we can we can make some more money doing this. And then you get more and more. And now yeah. as you saturate the market, everyone can it's, afford it's it. It's no longer confined to the owner of Yeti Cooler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Other people yeah. That too. You bring up spray foam. That's another place there's hidden costs. Because what do they tell you about the spray foam? What do you reduce on your AC and heating system? Yeah, the tonnage. The tonnage. <laughs> yeah. And they say you're going to save enough money to offset the cost yeah. of the spray foam. But yeah. what do they not tell you? You have to be able to do for the house to be healthy. You have to let it breathe. You have you to bring have in to some fresh, fresh air. air. Yeah. 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 It offsets the cost you were spending for the yeah. tonnage you reduce. Yeah. Yeah. That's my point is that if, you don't, if you're not educated, if you're not in yeah. tune with things, you're not asking those questions, right. you don't know and you get sucked in and you think, I'm going to save three tons of AC. Yeah, yeah but you're going to p- spend more money to do a higher energy efficiency on your hot yeah. water heater, all those things. Yeah. And you just have to explain to people where they're, re- where they're saving the money. is. It's called energy efficiency. You're not spending as much going out to the uh, utility district, which when you go to sell a house, no one looks at your utility bills and goes, great job. I want to pay you extra because you spent all that money with the utility company, right? So every bit of dollar you can save by doing something, increasing the value of the asset that you own is a dollar you you stand getting back. So keep that in mind when you're selling your home, talk to your realtor, educate your realtor. And if you're a realtor, ask these questions. Do you right. have these elements? Yeah, Separate right. yourself. Give yourself yeah. an advantage. Well, guys, um, we're going to try to uh, shorten the es- episodes instead of keeping them an hour long. Uh, w- can you believe it's been 30 minutes? And um, I made it through this whole episode with 
Randy mentioning grinding stumps, and I didn't come back to it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I put, try to put those little, you know, a, Listen, you Easter serve them up like that. I, I, I'm too Easter tempted egg. to knock them out of the park. I'm not leaving the podcast without <laughs> mentioning, I haven't mentioned the cat. I normally mention the cat. The, 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 yeah. the cat's still here, so that's so, uh, the cat, And he didn't bail out, so we've yeah. only had one episode well, out of, what, six out. now. What he's, he's one for six for bailing out. He's hanging in there. And didn't we you come to a right. decision on the name recently? Uh, so that did we, we did we all come up with one? Was uh, I not here? I think you may. Have. We, we discussed it when you were not here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we made you president. I, exactly I think we made you pre- yeah. president while you were. It's a lowercase p, <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> not a capital p. There. I think we left the p anthem. off. Actually, <laughs> we changed our intro. We changed our intro. Also, you're announcing the national anthem. Oh yeah, yeah. So yes. There you go. Yeah, oh, yeah right. So. Yeah. Can you see? We did touch on your singing abilities. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I'm not shy in front of a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen that. We've seen that. <laughs> well, it's been a great episode, guys. Everyone out there in uh, YouTube and Facebook land, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we will catch you next week. Same bat time, same bat place, 530 Wednesdays, even though it's Thursday right now. So uh, and unless otherwise notified, it'll be Wednesday at 530. So, right, uh, nice. Thanks for everyone tuning in. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Have a great, great weekend. <laughs>